Welcome, everybody. I think if you're sitting here today, you're curious about what Spark has to offer in terms of stream processing. Uh, the last uh, years, Spark has been evolving uh, at a serious fast pace and has introduced uh, two streaming processing APIs. Today, I'm going to tell you about the two streaming processing API available, uh, where, what are they good for, how they differ, and where you should be using one or the other. It might be confusing that there are like two APIs for single stream processing uh, framework. And uh, what I want to do today is to, when you walk out this door, you will have a good idea of when to use one, when to use the other, what are the capabilities of each one of them, and probably get you inspired in uh, starting your first project with a uh, stream APIs of Apache Spark. I'm Gerard Mas. Uh, I've been an early adopter of a, um, the Apache Spark project. I've been hacking on it since it was 0.9 as well as Kafka and related technologies. I've been, uh, I have uh, been a Scala enthusiast. And the last year and a half, I've been busy writing a stream processing with Apache Spark together with my colleague, Francois Garillo. And uh, yeah, today I'm going to tell you the TLDR of what we, are been, we have been working on for that book. We have included support and coverage uh, for structured streaming since it came out. And we have also learned the lessons of when to use the, each of the two APIs. Uh, so I, I want to bring, let's say, a summary of those last 18 months that I've been working on this project. Uh, and I'm going to give it to you today. Uh, I work for Likevent. Um, for those of you who are not familiar yet with Likevent, we are the company behind Scala, Akka, Play, Lagom and a number also of commercial offerings uh, that are building up on top of these great technologies to enable uh, microservices as well as fast data applications. Uh, personally, I work in the fast data team, and I am uh, currently working on a project that enables the uh, connection of different uh, stream uh, components, streaming components to create pipelines. If you are interested in knowing more about that, I am in the Lightband booth in the exposition, and I'll be glad to, to give a glimpse what that is. Uh, so, as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, uh, I want to give you uh, insights on what the streaming capabilities of Spark are. Uh, and I'm going to do this using interactive coding. Uh, I have prepared a number of uh, notebooks that I'm going to take you through using a anomaly detection use case as a leading uh, line through those, uh, through those notebooks. Um, I think, I don't know if uh, Spark needs introduction. Who we have used already Apache Spark? All right, Spark streaming, structure streaming. All right, so you are going to learn a lot today. And uh, I'll take that into account. Thanks a lot. Um, so Apache Spark is a distributed computing framework. It is very good at taking a huge amount of data uh, you know, on a cluster, organizing the data in, in terms of partitions and clusters, uh, running on executors, and then um, applying functions to that. That is what the bottom line there is doing. The Apache Spark core defines something called a, a resilient distributed data set. Nowadays, you don't see much of it in the APIs, but it's still there, and it's pretty much the, the driving force behind the distributed computing capabilities of Spark. Over the last four years, things have been evolving really quickly as, as Spark SQL added or beloved a, a SQL interfaces to Apache Spark, so it makes it very accessible for people of different backgrounds to start uh, writing code or writing queries, query SQL queries, that uh, are applied on large amounts of data. Uh, Spark became famous uh, in a kind of a Hadoop replacement idea, uh, and then quickly on implemented a streaming model, and that streaming model is called a uh, macro-batch streaming because it was exploiting the capabilities of a Spark to act, act on batch of data. So what we did was take small batches of data and then apply uh, transformations quickly on that and then get the next uh, batch. That is what the Spark streaming is doing. Uh, that's the most 
uh, let's say, deployed API out there. Uh, it started uh, in 2014. And uh, structure streaming is a newer version of that uh, of the streaming processing capabilities of, of Apache Spark and builds up on top of the SQL abstractions. Not only the abstractions like the data frames and data sets, but also the optimization. So there is a catalyst, there's a query optimizer there is going to try to push push down some predicates and trying to optimize the way that the the query that your streaming processing is representing is the best translated into a physical model to be executed on, on a cluster. Uh, this is all, of course, cluster computing, you, but it's amazing to try on your laptop as well. You don't need a huge cluster to start working in Apache Spark. It runs as well uh, on your own laptop, which is what I'm going to be uh, showing today. Never risk connecting to the cloud from Wi-Fi. Um, all right, so let's start uh, with structured streaming. What is the idea behind structured streaming? Structured streaming takes that concept that um, the data flowing into a system could be represented as a table if we knew the schema of it. And, uh, and it's, it's pretty natural to think about it. When you have a database and you have, uh, let's say, a table of users, users do not appear there by the millions. They appear one by one, they come one by one as they register into your system if they are acquired, and then uh, they become like part of that database. But if, at, at the origin of that, each user was an event, an event of a creation of that user in the database. Well, let's, let's take a step back. Instead of having a record in the database, we can consider that this event, this user is passing through our system, and we can already start applying logic to it before it actually lands on any database, but we can reason about it as it was a row on a database. So for example, we can do a transformation here, select user, and get the uh, first name, last name, and address. This is a linear transformation from a row that came in to a row that came out. You don't need a database in between. That's the key idea of data frames. So data comes in, it comes, uh, you need to give it uh, in a schema. That's very important because it gives you the access to each field. Uh, data piles up virtually on a virtual table called a streaming data frame. And then you define a query at the other side. But at one side, data is coming in. At the other side, you have a query. And that query represents what you want to extract of that data. Then the, uh, the optimizer it will look at your query and say, how much, do I, how much data do I need to satisfy this query? Let's say I'm calculating the average of the, my, my latest hits on my, on my website uh, for the last 15 minutes. Okay, so or a count. If you're counting the last 15 minutes of data and you want each 15 minutes an, uh, a count, total count of that, then you need to keep in memory 15 minutes of data. You don't need more than that. So you don't need to collect the whole day and then run a report at the end of the day, which was what was happening in the early days. And that's, that's a key model. You have data coming in. It's coming in, in, into streams. There is a query uh, based on the table concept. The table is actually not there. It's a conceptual table. And then the optimizer will look at your query and we de will decide how much data do I need to keep uh, to have a, an answer to that query in, on a regular basis. That's uh, called a recurrent query because it's executing every moment or every time that we need an answer. It can be as fast as possible. That's the default mode of execution. So a best effort. Once I finish doing my query, I restart doing my query. And it gives you almost kind of real-time feedback. Um, but of course, there is still the concept of mini batch behind it. There are different runtimes, as we will see later on. And at the end, of course, we want your data to land somewhere. So we have that output mode there. And that output mode says, I want append. So I want my data only when a record has been completely formed. For example, if I want 15 minutes aggregations, I want to wait until the end of my 15 minutes. But maybe I want to update every minute. Oh, how far are we yet? And then that output mode will be update instead of append. And uh, at the end, you can output the data back to Kafka, to files, and there are also com uh, programmable facilities to write the data to uh, any backend there. There are also two, two the console and memory, they are there to help you uh, with uh, trying out the API uh, explorations, in, in, in particular, ex explorative explorations. Uh, this, this duality, this, the stream table duality, is, is the, the back concept I, I, I like to share it with you. It's from Tyler. 
uh, from Google. That's, that's the person behind uh, um, Apache Beam and Google Data Flow. Uh, I, they, they are actually summarizing what uh, structure streaming is implementing. There is a stream, and the stream can be uh, conceptually viewed as a data set over time. And if you take a data set, that's the, the second equation there. If you have already uh, de deployed system, you have a database, and you want to migrate to streaming, so you can start looking at the, at the call, the uh, change records, or the change records of your database, export it as a stream, and depart from there to fuel your uh, streaming capabilities in your organization. They are very important, and in, in particular, the first one is the, the concept behind structural streaming. Uh, let's start with some, with some code. Um, give you a view of what the API looks like, how we work with it. And for that, I'm going to use two things. Um, one, uh, uh, notebooks based on the Spark notebook. This is a Belgian project. Uh, they have been created by my old friend Andy Petrella uh, here in Belgium, and it's a great tool to interactively play with Apache Spark, in particular with the streaming, because it has all these updatable uh, widgets uh, where you can see the data flow into the system. At, uh, at the one side, at the ingest, I have this sensor. Uh, so this sensor is a sound level sensor. It's, it's not recording you in, in, in any... A discernible way, your privacy is saved, uh, but it's, it does uh, record the sound levels in this environment, and we're going to use this to see what, what kind of uh, processing can we do on the data to find something interesting to say about it. Um, that is fronted with an ACA application, the sensor data multiplexer. I recorded data previously at home at my office, and um, I will be replaying that data so that the sensor is not, does not feeling alone. That, I mean, it's kind of silly to talk about big data when you only have a little silly little sensor connected to your system. Uh, so there are other thousand sensors being replayed there, so we can have a little bit of data to play uh, when we start working with structure streaming and Spark streaming. Uh, that's the sensor inside, so it's a Wi-Fi chip, but I connect it to USB, don't trust Wi-Fi on, on any conference, and it's actually giving you the, the sound levels around you. All right, so let's start with our first demonstration. And today will be about demonstration, so buckle up, uh, because we have quite some to get through. The first one, hey, can we all read this? These screens are amazing. All from the back. OK? Great. Perfect. So um, what we're going to do is to start playing with the structure streaming. And the first thing we want to do is to read data from Kafka. As I explained, my, my sensor here is connected to an ACA uh, application. You can, call, you can call it nowadays a microservice. And my microservice is adding data, is putting data into Kafka. Kafka is running on Docker locally on my machine as well. And here are the parameters of my a um, Kafka broker. That's the, the first interesting thing we are going to observe. This is how we read data in a structured streaming. We say we read the stream, we give a format. The format can be here Kafka. In this case, I'm going to read from Kafka. It could be a file, a, um, could be a network, so a network socket. And, uh, and then the other options are then uh, applying to that specific format that we are using. At the end of this, we get a data frame. But the data frame, for those who know Spark and have been using Spark for batch processing, is exactly the same API, except that some operations do not apply to streaming. For example, let's say you wanted to count how many, how many elements have passed to a stream. That's undefined, because that number might be in, uh, infinite and depends on every moment in time that you are you are looking at it. So you could do a count over aggregations, but you cannot do count over the stream itself. Whereas if this was a batch a, a data frame coming from a file, you could count all the records of the file. So these kinds of things are slight little differences. And uh, from the API point of view, we can ask if it's streaming, and then we will see that the streaming is true. Every uh, data frame or data set in Apache Spark has a, a touch schema in the case of the Kafka producer for streams. Uh, it has a fixed schema, so it has a key, a value, the topic is coming from, and so metadata information like that. Wh which partition I came from, the offset where I was, and the timestamp. Um, 
it's, that's, that's, of course, very important where we are thinking about preserving data ordering or doing special things about partitioning, but it's not really what we're interested in today. We want to focus on the data, and the data is actually um, nested in, in that value, so it's a payload of that value object there. And uh, to extract the data, we are going to say, okay, that data is, is, is in a specific format. In my case, it's encoded as JSON. And the first thing is, uh, sorry, I forgot to execute this. So I have defined a case class for those not familiar with Scala. It's, it's like a Java bean. You can call it a bit like that. It's just a data specification. It has an ID, a timestamp, a temperature, a humidity. Um, the temperature and humidity were the sensors deployed in my office. They were recorded, so I, I kept a little bit the same. This is the only sensor that is recording sound levels. Okay, uh, and then now I, I am going to use SQL. I'm going to use a cast. Uh, this is an SQL expression in a select. Uh, I am going to use functions from a Spark um, SQL that you may already know, like uh, from JSON, I'm going to transform that value from JSON into a record, and at the end of the day, I'm going to end up with a type, type safe object, a type safe collection of the type sensor data that I declared earlier on. All right, now my stream is not that original Kafka stream anymore, we have transformed it. And we have transformed it from that key value pair together with metadata into a sensible uh, stream that contains the data that interests us. So there's a new schema of that stream, it's just being transformed, data has not been changed, of course, uh, and actually nothing has happened yet, there is no single record that we have consumed from Kafka yet. We need to start something in order to have that, that data recording happening or data consumption happening. Okay, uh, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to visualize that data. How, the, how is the data looking like? And for that, I'm going to try my first output um, or materialization mode. Uh, I, for that, we use the write stream. Write stream materializes a stream into some sync. And uh, in my case, I'm using the memory sync. And I'm using the memory sync to have the data available for the notebook. Normally, you may put this back into Kafka, or you could write it in files or to a database. Uh, I want to have a look directly to it, so I want to have it in memory, and I can, be, uh, as a temporary table, I can query that temporary table called visualization, that's the name, same name that we used there. That table is not a streaming table, but it's backed by the streaming source, so we will have, see data coming in uh, all the time. So we see there, if, if we, if we uh, issue count several times, uh, then we have uh, the, the data, the number of uh, elements increasing. Uh, this is really um, about defining widgets and, uh, um, and updating them. So this is a background thread that needs to run. And now we're going to have a chart and have a look at the data. So this is how the data looks like uh, that is being uh, filtering on specifically my DevOx sensor. So it's not all the data set that is coming in, only that DevOx sensor. And uh, if, we, if we see here, we can observe variations of that data immediately. So we are running on best effort on a structured streaming, capturing the data and processing it uh, through this uh, a small pipeline uh, directly to the graphical interface of the notebook. Okay, uh, as we have done this, we can also route it to something else. Um, the data coming from the sensor is quite jagged. So we, I'm going to use, and jagged, it has a lot of noise. Well, it's, it's a sound sensor. It contains noise, but it also contains some, some electronic noise in it. Uh, and I want to get rid of it. One of the methods to, to filter out uh, some of that noise is to create a, a um, moving average uh, of, that, of that signal. Uh, to smooth out the signal, and I am going to use a particular feature of a structured streaming. Structured streaming is able to understand event time, and that's something that has been particularly difficult in some of the uh, stream processing systems, in particular the original stream processing from Apache Spark. Uh, and um, structured streaming adds that concept of a timestamp, and I want to, I can understand the timestamp, and I can uh, issue operations on it. Like, for example, here I'm going to uh, define the sliding window. Every 30 seconds, I want, the, uh, I want a length of 30 seconds, or so 30 seconds of data all the time, and every 10 seconds, I want an average. That's a definition of a, of a moving average. Uh, so I have more data 
uh, over time, and that data is being averaged out so that my signal actually gets smoother. Uh, we're going to visualize this to see how, how that looks like. Uh, the same method here, I don't need to get into details. Um, the only thing is, uh, is worth mentioning is that in this case here, uh, we see the data is it's empty. Why? Uh, we had the streaming, the streaming, I see my stream is running there, and this is a particularity of dealing with, with time. Um, in my query here, I specify that there is a watermark. That watermark is saying, how do I deal with data that is late? Or how do I deal with data that is out of order if I'm trying to order things? How long can I wait for data to be late? So if, if, my, if I'm processing mobile phone data, I, can I accept that cars go through tunnels and then suddenly stop reporting data and whatever they report later can, comes with, with a timestamp that does not correspond with the current time, time anymore? Uh, this is what event times is about. It's about considering the time of the event when the event happened and not when I'm processing it. Uh, in, the, in the case of, uh, of, of this model, I have to tell them how long I can wait for data. In my case, I'm saying I wait for 30 seconds. I actually don't have to, but it's just to give you the idea of how, how that's working. So I have to wait 30 seconds plus the 30 seconds of my window. I have to wait at least one minute to have any data coming out of that, uh, of that query. And I don't know if I spoke already for a minute, uh, but we can... Uh, have a look here to see if we have a bit of data. Voila! So we have data there. I think time uh, DevOps moves faster than usual. And then um, we can visualize it the same way we did it before. Uh, we have just a couple of, uh, of data uh, elements. So every 30 seconds now, sorry, every 10 seconds, we have uh, one uh, um, um, event coming in that contains the average of the last 30 seconds of data. All right, so I am going to stop all these visualization uh, queries, otherwise I run out of CPU. And uh, the last thing I'm going to do is to take this process, so my process of uh, smoothing out the signal of, of that uh, sensor, and I'm going to write it back to Kafka. We are creating then a flow that reads raw data from Kafka, cleans it up. In my case, I'm smoothing out the signal and writing back to Kafka. Uh, how do I do this? Well, first I need to create a Kafka-specific format. Uh, to write to Kafka, I need a key and a value. And once I have my key and my value, I can just say, please write it to Kafka, and start that query. And I hope that change the checkpoint, otherwise I will have a failure here. So this is uh, one of the monitoring interfaces um, for a structure streaming and not monitoring really, but just uh, querable interfaces to see that things are moving. And uh, I see that there is data flowing through the system. Let me see that I have more than one row available. I need a minute. Okay, I'll check that once we're back. Let's go back to our presentation. Just a quick recapitulation of what we have seen so far. How is a structured streaming API looking like and the programming model? The first thing that we see is that we use a read stream. Uh, it's important in this context because for normal Spark users, before you were using read to read a data set, you said read stream to read a stream, uh, a stream source. Uh, very natural, you only learn one model to think about data processing and you can apply it both to batch and streaming. Um, there are a number of operations. You, if once you learn the uh, data set, the data frame API, or Spark SQL is working, then you can apply it also to the uh, stream processing here. I'm using a select expression, so I'm using actually a, an expression coming from SQL. Uh, I, I am also using the functions that are defined in uh, Spark SQL, like from JSON, and there are others that we will see next. Um, to process, process the data and obtain a, a result. So those are, those are all transformation, all lazy, that will be applied once I, things have been started. At the end of the day, I, I like uh, tape safe interfaces. So I'm saying this thing has a type and it's a type of a sensor data, so it's not so loosely a um, you know, bunch of fields, but it has a type and I can reason about my type. Also be sure what kind of data is, is flowing through my system. 
Uh, even time, as I mentioned, I think I, I made uh, already um, a highlight of this. Um, it's important uh, in cases when you're dealing with data that contains a timestamp and when that you want to process the data from the point of view of when it was created. It could be sensors, it could be, uh, let's say, web logs coming from different data centers when the time is shifting. This is an important feature for you and you, you can explore it. There are two concepts there, the watermark to say how long can I wait for data that is, um, that is too late. And um, there are a number of aggregations supported there that will impact the way that the data is accumulated, so the data is being aggregated in the system. And you can apply, like here, a bunch of existing SQL functions. In this case, I am aggregating over the average of the temperature values. Sinks provide you a way of uh, bringing those results somewhere. In this case, we call the sync with the write stream. So you read stream, you do operations, you write the stream. Very simple. And with this, uh, let's say, basic concept, you can build up quite uh, powerful structures by combining several of those stream processing components together. Okay, there is a different formats, and at the end, you start. Once you do say start here, that query lifecycle starts. Uh, Lifecycle management is on the query basis, it's per query that you can start and stop things. It's very handy when you have like different transformations all happening in, in one single context. Um, so where do you want, oh, you, could, you could apply this if you have a streaming ATL applications that you want to transfer, uh, transform the data as it arrives to the system. Um, you have uh, IoT information or da data that contains uh, time embedded in the data timestamps, or you want to apply uh, um, aggregations or reasoning on that data based on the, on the event time. Um, there, is, there is an API for a stateful, uh, arbitrary stateful stream processing. Uh, it's a mouthful, and what it means is that you can define uh, aggregations that do not relate to things that are already built in. Uh, let's say you want to compute uh, the path of, of taxis in a city. So a taxi starts, it has a route and it stops. There is no window of 10, 10 minutes or 20 seconds that will, that will always contain a segment of, of those routes. But then with uh, a stateful stream processing, you can uh, start looking at the data from the point of view, from a perspective of your business case, of your application, and then create sessions of that data and uh, stateful computations of data. For example, I want to compute fuel consumption for every trip that has happened in the, in the city. I would do this with a arbitrary stateful stream processing, but that would take like another DevOps session to, to go into that. Uh, it's very powerful, but uh, with the power also comes uh, some complexity that you need to deal with. Uh, you can don't join streams, and um, important, uh, you can apply machine learning models. Apply Apache comes with Apache, uh, sorry, Apache Spark comes with uh, a Spark ML Leap. Contains a number of implementation of uh, machine learning models that can be trained on the batch mode. So the, the training on streaming is currently not supported. You can train on batch mode, and then the trained model can be loaded in the streaming context and applied to the data that is passing by. So you can use um, <coughs> streaming scoring of a, a model that you have trained already. All right. That was in a nutshell, that uh, structured streaming offers. Now I'm going to talk to you about Spark Streaming. Spark Streaming is the first implementation of a streaming computation in Apache Spark. And it looks similar in, in terms of data in and data out. Actually, all stream processing systems are following exactly the same pattern. Uh, but the concept is different. So here we're not talking about schemas, we're not talking about tables. We are talking about segments of data. Uh, called blocks, and those blocks that you see uh, uh, that I drew there uh, like surrounding the data um, are collected over time, and the time is a micro batch, and then provided to Apache Spark. Uh, some people call this the uh, micro batch model, that's because the data is not flowing event per, per event into the system. Uh, there is a wait time, so there is like a bus filling in before leaving and uh, you depart with a number of, uh, of persons in that bus to be delivered 
to their destination. Uh, whereas there are other systems out there like Flink that act more like the taxi. You arrive at the airport, you jump in the taxi, and it brings you to your destination. It's faster end to end, but then the throughput is also very different. Um, always use the best tool for the job. Uh, so before implementing anything, please take a look at the different alternatives out there uh, because there is no one size fits all. All right, uh, how does it work? Data comes in, it's broken down into, into those blocks. Those blocks are transformed into this native uh, data structure in Spark called the Brazilian Distributed data, frame, data Set. And it's trans you can apply transformations to this and you can bring it to some system or afterward. Um, it, the API is, is functional, it's based actually inspired by the uh, Scala uh, collections and um, very different from a structured streaming that is applying this SQL model and this kind of uh, SQL DSL on top of data frames and data sets. Data frames are inspired by pandas uh, from Python. Whereas this is coming more from the functional programming model. I have functions that I can distribute in a cluster. Um, the, my logic goes into the closures of the functions and those closures get serialized and distributed. It's lower level. Uh, it takes considerable more effort to understand what's happening. And it's of course uh, handy for you when you need to implement very specific use cases. So if you are into data transformation to very general, let's say, uh, needs of the modern data-driven uh, um, enterprise, uh, probably you will be leaning to use uh, structured streaming. If you have very specific requirements, for example, I, I helped a, a renowned uh, consultancy company to solve a specific problem that was dealing with uh, keeping the states of events of machines over time, and the events uh, ordering was very specific, and their uh, Spark streaming was, was the right answer. Um, Spark Streaming also gives you access to directly programming using Scala or Java. And then if you have a code base, I also help the company doing that. If you have already a code base that is, has invested in, in some libraries and some functions that are uh, already given there and available, you can hook them into a streaming uh, computation using a Spark Streaming probably faster than trying to translate uh, that model into the uh, data frame driven a transformation that uh, a structured streaming is offering you. Actions are what you use to, to get the data out of the streaming computation and produce it somewhere. All the, all the actions uh, are based on this for each RDD, that's like the main basic function, the, the most uh, native, uh, to apply any computation. You can also apply any library that you have or existing uh, libraries from Apache Spark as well or other frameworks. Uh, on the uh, for each RDD context. So you can get the results of your stream and pass it on to whatever this has been used actually to implement connectors to, for example, Apache Cassandra from Elasticsearch, et cetera, et cetera. They are available because of the power and flexibility of, of this operation. Right, so we have arrived to a uh, second part of, of, the, of this uh, pipeline, the streaming pipeline. I have a second notebook. It's going to consume the data that we produced by the, the first notebook. So uh, we are, as, as we recall, we had the raw data. The raw data is passing by this uh, smoothing process. The smoothing process is now put back into Kafka. I am going to read that now and create a uh, anomaly detection model. I'm using a very, let's say, naive approach of computing in stream fashion the standard deviation, and, um, oh, sorry, I need to get out of this, and I'm going to go to sensor anomaly. All right. Okay. Now let's see how a Spark streaming looks like. Um, all right, so same thing. I, this is are just uh, common uh, parameters I need uh, to connect to my system. Um, standard deviation. So the particularity of this, and we, we all know it, we learned it at school, uh, is that it needs access to all the data. So if you want the, the standard deviation of a data set, you need to look at the whole, all the data set, all the values available there, you need to average them out, and then uh, you need to count them to then fulfill that, um, that equation there. 
Luckily, there are implementations that work by looking at every element, element by element. And there is a link here to a Wikipedia um, <coughs> article where there is, an there is an offered an algorithm called M2, where you can do uh, online training of a, a, a standard deviation uh, model. So instead of, of having to collect all the data beforehand, I'm going to look at every element of the data, I'm going to feed them through this M2 model, and I'm going to build up a knowledge of what is the standard deviation, what is the medium of my data for each element uh, in there, and, um, and I use that to evaluate the new data that is arriving. Uh, so this is an implementation of the M2. I don't want to go into the details. It's, it's not that easy. Uh, you see it's a little bit of, of uh, mathematics. But the important point I want you to take away from, from this piece of code here is that there are two levels of execution. And this is important in Spark streaming. There is one level of execution that's saying, I have a this stream and I'm going to apply a transformation to the DStream. In this case, I'm going to extract the data from the DStream and I'm going to do something with it every time that new data comes in. And as data comes in, I have access to that data in a distributed fashion. And this RDD that I mentioned before is a distributed um, data a um, distributed data set is located in the cluster, and I can execute this computation clustered. I can use all the computing power that I have. And in this case, it's not very heavy, but the concept is the same if you need to apply a, a, let's say heavy computation on some data that needs a cluster to achieve that. I can do this distributedly. And then I can get only the results of that. So I don't need to, to go into every element. I just can get the results. And I'm going to add the results locally. So I have a duality. And before we had like the string table duality here, I have my local cluster duality. This is Spark Streaming is very strong in that. You, ca you have access to the local um, context. And in that local context, you can keep like mutable variables like I'm doing here. Uh, you can have access to uh, other servers, network access, uh, access to uh, um, sockets, for example, if you connect to a database. And then use that data that you have collected and use the power of the cluster to apply that data to a lot of elements. In, in, in a system that, that I helped implement a time, some time ago, we were kind of collecting parameters for processing from a REST server and then applying that to IoT data that was coming in a, in a high throughput. All right, this is the key here without going into the specific details line by line. Uh, what it is going to do is going to apply and compute that um, moving average in, sorry, a, a streaming computation of my a standard deviation. And um, the rest I need to do is I need to obtain the data. So I'm going to connect. You see as well that the API is different. Here I need to create a, stre a stream. I need to give decoders, whereas in a structured streaming was a little bit probably more high level. I just say I want data from Kafka and I get it. And then I, the, 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 the schema is already predefined. Here I, I need to get more into the nuts and bolts of the implementation. Um, here again, I'm, I'm creating this model locally and I'm going to uh, be training that model locally, making use of the, uh, re the resources from the cluster. Um, all right, so we do some streaming transformations. Uh, in this case, I'm actually doing the same as I was doing before, but on the RDD API. I'm going to have data that is uh, JSON data using some schema, and I'm going to transform it as it is uh, sensor data information, and I use it to train the model. All right, uh, once um, we have defined all the transformations here, so. Here I am transforming my data, and I have an ID and a value that I require to train the model. I train the model here, and once uh, I have that uh, train model, I can predict over that model. And this is something that we're not going to directly use in this uh, notebook because we're going to do the predictions uh, using the uh, other API. So we have some charts, and the, what I need to do now, so I have now two queries. I, need the, I have this query that is uh, calculating and computing the model, the other that is applying the model. I have a third one that is just putting data on the chart. It's not doing anything yet. And uh, they all depend on a, a start. 
So whereas we saw here, we have like two queries, two additional queries. Uh, whereas before we had this uh, concept that we had a query, we could start it and stop it independently of the others. Here we talk about the context, and the context is all or nothing. Our streaming context has uh, the lifecycle management of the whole uh, job. So we need to get to the point where we say, okay, I can go to the streaming context and um, I'm going to start it. Uh, the last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to write the results back to Kafka. Uh, so with those, um, so now I have defined the model, and the parameters that I compute online uh, on that model are going to be written back to Kafka. All right, and as I mentioned before, um, we have this for each RDD uh, function, and I am using a Spark SQL within. A Spark streaming, so they are not mutually exclusive. You can mix and match the, the two APIs in this way. And last but not least, we can start the whole process. As I said, it's an all or nothing approach. So once we say start, then all the operations will be scheduled and will be starting to execute. And we should be seeing some data flowing if everything went well. All right, let's see. should see data in less than 30 seconds, and there we, uh, there we are. So we have in our, our debug box, uh, so we have some, DevOx, uh, some data coming from the DevOps sensor, and we should be seeing here the distribution of data from the other simulated sensors as well. All right. Okay, so that was uh, Spark Streaming. In a nutshell, let's go through the uh, important elements, very important in Spark Streaming, different from what we saw in Structured Streaming, is that you have a streaming context, and that streaming context is an all or nothing thing. It, will, it applies to the, to the whole computation, and uh, it's bound to some time. And that time is a time window that you wait for data to arrive. So every 10 seconds, I'm going to be doing something here. Then um, I can read data, and there are multiple implementations. There are, Twitter there are Twitter consumers, there are Kafka consumers. In this case, I'm using the Kafka consumer. Um, there are uh, um, adapters made for Kinesis. There is a project called Apache Bashir, Bahir, uh, that implements many of those connectors for uh, Spark Streaming. That it lets you quickly connect to any external system. And you have the concept of transformations, where you get the access to that RDD data, uh, that, that data uh, set representing your data in the cluster. So it's not local, but you think about the computations that you're doing it in a functional way, and then it's really independent of a location. Are you running locally or are you running on the cluster? Uh, we created a, a do-it-yourself model, do-it-yourself streaming model by creating this variable uh, locally and then training it in the cluster. So this is the, the relationship between the cluster and local. And last but not least, we put data out somehow. And here, this is the output that you see on the notebook is done by outputting using the for each RDD as well as writing to Kafka. All right, what are the use cases av available for Spark Streaming? Um, let's say things that are more complex than what we were doing before with uh, structured streaming. So things that involve state management from local and the cluster. Uh, you can implement uh, online uh, training of machine learning models. You can join the streams with updatable data sets, so with databases uh, located or in, in your cluster, and join with the data that is coming from the stream to realize some use case. And then, uh, so to close, I have a few minutes left. I want to show you uh, how we can bring these two elements together. Uh, so I have a continuous processing. Continuous processing is a um, experimental API in um, in structured streaming that is available uh, currently uh, in the Spark since Spark 2.3 and implements a real-time processing engine. Whereas the, the normal runtime is a micro batch based, this one will deploy a topology of executors of processors and will be able to do. Uh, uh, element by element processing. But the problem here is that uh, once that, that process starts, you cannot stop it. So I am combining it with the Spark Streaming to do what we call a control stream. Spark Streaming holds the context, gets the high level data, 
in my case, gets the model parameters, and then passes the model parameters to a real-time stream function that is able to score data in real time. It's, uh, I, I just want to show you how that thing works. Um, but it's maybe not enough time to go into the details. So I am replicating here some of the, of the elements that I require, some of the M2 model, the context, and uh, I am going to read data from Kafka. Once I have the data from Kafka, this is, this is the key here. Um, we read the stream and write the stream back in the context of a Spark streaming and uh, applying a structured streaming in continuous mode. So this continuous mode, the trigger is to do the checkpointing from time to time. And we have in that uh, piece of code here, a real time flow from Kafka to Kafka using the parameters of the model being scored in real time and brought back into another topic. This is very exciting if it works sometimes. It's, it's an experimental API, so sometimes it, it kind of crashes on me. Um, and then to visualize it, I am going to create another consumer, so I'm actually consuming that data again. Uh, my visualizer is, is uh, grouping the data a little bit so that we have a better visualization. And what I'm doing now is what we did in the first notebook, just capturing the data, putting it in, in memory, to be able to uh, render a chart out of it. So I'm going to define some um, data model for, for my chart and uh, instantiate the chart and run. All right, so let's wait like a second. We should be seeing some data from the existing um, elements if there is no error happening, okay. This is always, okay, so we have there data, so we have few sensors and this should be DevOps. So we can now influence that by, uh, for example, creating some, uh, some additional input to the sensor and the sensor will be, the, the, the data will be then being scored and computed in the, uh, in the detection system. So here I have actually my candidates. Um, I think there is something wrong because normally it's uh, ah, there. We go. There we go. Had a little a little delay so far from my uh, let's say from my real time demonstration. All right, um, this is what I wanted to show you. So we can combine uh, structured streaming with the Spark streaming to then uh, use like the best of both worlds to implement our use cases. Um, then, uh, in a nutshell, or final slide uh, regarding the content. We have uh, on the one side a structured streaming, on the other side a Spark streaming. How do they compare on these three axes? So we have time. In structured streaming, we saw that there are different concepts of time. There is processing time, there is event time that is actually abstracted out from the API. In Spark streaming, this is a fixed micro batch interval. We saw there was 10 seconds, so there are batches, batches of time uh, that need to be respected. If you do windows, they need to be related to that fixed interval. So there, the flexibility goes to uh, structured streaming. On the execution side, uh, we now have two runtimes for uh, structured streaming, the experimental continuous mode that we just saw, and then the, the fixed micro batch plus best effort. So when you run in best effort, you run as soon as possible. It gives you the, Im the impression that you're running almost real time. And Spark Streaming is fixed micro batch uh, and is, is usable when you have to deal with, with some high throughput that you can control in some, in some way. Uh, the abstraction in structured streaming, we talk about data frames, data sets. It applies the whole data set and data frame API that is available in Apache Spark. Uh, so there's a lot of new functions there, a lot of implementation for SQL windows, SQL uh, aggregations. Uh, where, whereas on the Spark Streaming, you have access to the RDDs. It's a low-level functional API where you have to write your own code. It's then it is uh, the, the other side of that coin is that you have access to the low-level capabilities of a Spark and you can implement your own things when required. The star here is that in Spark Streaming, you have access to the scheduler, something that is not available on a, a structured streaming. So if you, just a rule of thumb, when you are facing a new project and you want to apply uh, streaming capabilities and you are, have some knowledge on Apache Spark, then 80% of the time, in just again, a rule of thumb, you will be using a structured streaming and then only the 20% of the cases you will need the capabilities available in Spark streaming. Uh, then, like Bent, we, 
we have a fast data platform where we integrate all those components. And if you want to learn something more about it, or if you have uh, questions, please uh, come to the stand. I will be there the whole afternoon. We have a stand, the like bench stand in the exposition area. And if you want to contact me, here are my uh, contact points. I think we are now on time, and uh, thank you very much.